This presentation is called Guns, Germs, and Microservices. Um, I'm John Willis, and this is Josh Corman. Um, so Josh, you want me to tell people sure, who you are? Sure, sure. <laughs> I think more people know you than they know me here. Um, but um, I'll tell you a little bit how I met Josh, but for those who don't know, he's the CTO over at Sonotype. Um, uh, very passionate about security. The people say, people who know me, I, I, I'll tell you my background in a minute, or Josh will tell you my background. Um, know me that I'm very passionate about infrastructure and things like that. I met Josh a couple of years ago, and he's extremely passionate about saving lives. So uh, he might tell you a little bit about that. So not just security and the infrastructure, but saving people. So, Josh. Um. So I was going to introduce John as well, but um, just as part of the intro, Gene unfortunately could not be here with us, but this is the second annual uh, Rugged DevOps at RSA. What we really wanted to do is take the best and brightest from the security community that were leaning forward and seeing that DevOps wasn't just a buzzword, but it was really uh, an evolutionary fork in the road. Uh, but we wanted to combine them, not just with security people, but with some of the best and brightest from the DevOps movement itself. Um, we showed this, and it was a big hit, since we have a bunch of first-timers. This is how most of our community looks at DevOps, beyond being a buzzword. They see these guys are going faster, it's reckless, it's irresponsible, it's criminal, it's immoral. Um, I, I would love to say that I invented this, but the guy who actually made it won't even let us use it for a t-shirt. So, um, <clears throat> But this is the view that we have, and I, I empathize with this view, and it's not going away, guys. So we can either look at not just what we're losing, but what we're gaining, and we can either ignore it and be disintermediated, or we can rise to the challenge and team with the people driving this, uh, this new mission. So what we realized, and this is Jez Humble who you're gonna see later today, is if we team with the top five to 10 pioneers in the DevOps community, and we can help them solve their problems, what things are they stuck on? How do we put something in their terms? So instead of like, uh, Rich Mogul's here, he's gonna present later, but he has this great line that any strategy that depends on a change in human nature is a strategy that's gonna fail. So instead of projecting what we needed and wanted and trying to force them to use our legacy approaches to application security, what we realize is they have challenges and problems and if we can make them on time, on budget, faster, uh, fewer break fixes, faster mean time to identify repair, then we were gonna have um, fast friends and teammates. So Jez has no idea what he's getting into, but a year later, we've actually done quite a bit. And I think the unifying factor here is when Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world, what he meant was every single company, regardless of what you do, is becoming a software company. Our closing uh, keynote is from American Airlines, right? Who would think of American Airlines as a software company? But everybody's a software company. John Deere doesn't call themselves a tractor company. They're a software delivery platform. And what this means is whoever's best at software wins, right? So the Fortune 100 is gonna look very, very different for the people who figure this out. Um, but as a security guy, we know that that's a pretty scary proposition. So part of that journey led me to uh, John Willis, goes by Bacha Galoop on Twitter, but he's one of the, the pioneers in the DevOps space. He, he may not have coined the DevOps term, but he certainly took it worldwide and is one of the founders and organizers of Dev, DevOps Days globally and runs one of the most popular podcasts, DevOps. Uh, cafe, but he can tell you his professional accomplishments, but people like him scare the bejesus out of me from a security perspective. So we can either like, wonder what they're gonna do and be terrified, or we can team up and do awesome things together. I'm the bad guy. <laughs> um, but in, in, oh, frankly, I spent 10 years pissing off developers and I got tired doing that, so I figured I'd piss off the security folk now. Uh, so um, yeah, but um, as I said, I've been in IT infrastructure my whole life. Um, really as operations, um, and just you know, not to bore you with all of that, but the last couple of years I've had a couple of startups, one I sold to Dell, and then recently uh, sold a company at Docker a year ago. So um, really, really interested in fast moving infrastructure. And I'll tell you a little bit how, why me and Josh kind of got together, why we're having this conversation, why we're presenting these stories. One shameless plug, I do have a DevOps Cafe podcast, which we've had Josh on, which actually is one of our best episodes. Um, and um, Jez Humble and myself and Gene and Patrick Dubois, who we call the godfather of DevOps, um, we've just completed a book called The DevOps Handbook, which is actually a companion piece to the Phoenix Project. So that um, it's actually orderable now. Well, uh, you'll start seeing copies of it show up various places soon. All right, so I want to tell you a story. Um, so in, in the beginning, I said uh, guns, germs, and microservices, right? 
Right, so um, I wanted to tell you a story, and of course I don't have my speaker notes. Um, there's a few numbers here. In 1532, there was this thing called the Battle of Kajimakara. 168 um, conquistadors, not really well-trained military, uh, defeated an army of 7,000, right? And uh, in, with, with basically malleable steel swords. Around 300 years later, four guns, four Maxim machine guns, defeat a South African tribe, these British soldiers of 5,000, four. Four, maybe eight people, right? And, and so, um, so the question is, how does, why is, like, or why is there this disconnect between civilizations? Why, why can 168 just decimate 7,000? It's a longer story, and it's actually, how many people have read Gun, Germs, and Steel? Yeah, quite a bit. Awesome. So um, a couple of summers, I'd always heard about this book. Uh, a couple of summers ago, my son uh, was doing his uh, summer, you know, they pile the kids up for dinner. The kids get no time off anymore. <laughs> you know, even the summers, they got to read about five or six, you know, books for school, right? So one of the books he had to read was this, and I was just kind of thumbing through it. And in the beginning, um, Jared Diamond, um, excellent book. Um, talks about the question that he set out to answer is why are there haves and have nots in the world? And wh what was interesting is um, not really a shameless plug, but my podcast, actually, Damon Edwards is speaking later today. Um, my podcast co host always would, would talk about the world in IT is going to be made up of haves and have nots. And we can see that with web scale, we see that with certain organizations and how fast they can move. And I said, oh my goodness, like, what if I can make a really cool analogy around like what Jared Diamond was talking about 10,000 years of civilization to IT infrastructure? And that's what people who present we do. We look for those hooks, right? But it was a good hook, right? So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, D Diamond postulates that um, around 10,000 years ago, there were certain kind of Goldilocks zones. He doesn't use that term, but in Euroasia, certain areas that were fertile zones. And of course... That's the area where the aggregate agriculture, people started managing uh, animals and, and cattle, or no, goats really, but um, in Euroasia. And then there, there became these feedback loops, right? And, and so, and then there were aggregate villages then forming around the, um, this aggregation of, um, of farming and, and um, ca uh, goat farming, whatever. And then the, the, the animals then created clothing. And so you created this kind of continuum. And then all of a sudden, not everybody had to be a farmer, right? The villages started creating tool makers. And then the people wanted to conquer. And this is like a really short minute and a half uh, version of a great Pearl of Surprising winning book. But, but what he really was talking about is something called cybernetics, which is an interesting concept that some of the people in UX now are talking about, cybernetic feedback loops. And this created a cybernetic feedback loop where it shortened the distance and latency of these things where the haves became the ones where we're able to condense this where the have-nots in general were not able to do that. So it creates some kind of terminal velocity. And there's, there's other things that happened as well. Like um, Francisco Pizarro was the leader of those 168 um, conquistadors. Yes, they had malleable steels, and their enemy had rocks and sticks and wood, but they also had um, Francisco Pizarro's cousin, Cortez, had defeated the Aztecs and actually had created strategy documentation. So they were able to just, again, see the feedback sense of it, right? That the feedback loop. So I gave this presentation at the beginning of last year at uh, DevOps, a keynote at DevOps Austin, DevOps Days Austin. And if you're from Austin, like, you should not miss DevOps Days Austin. In fact, every DevOps Day is pretty cool, but... I think that's my favorite. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of the best. Um, the, and Josh was presenting there, and I saw Josh's presentation, and so one of the things, um, you know, I'll get into what I call immutable delivery, immutable infrastructure, and I'll, and I'll try to cur go over that pretty quickly. Um, but one of the things I knew, and which is you know, a problem about going fast, like I, I'm all about going fast in infrastructure. And Josh was all about like security and like DevOps rugged, right, which is kind of moving faster in a different way. 
And we realized that we had a great story to tell. The combination of, you know, what I'm talking, going to talk about kind of this immutable stuff. We both are, um, we love Deming. And so, there, you know, I wrote this article beginning of last year, or late last year, called Immutable Delivery. It, it goes off of it, immutable infrastructure. Josh has been talking about supply chain. I'll add a little of that. We believe that that is, um, we called it a peanut butter and chocolate moment. We have a video, a longer version of this, at the DevOps Enterprise Summit last year, uh, Gene's um, DevOps Enterprise Survey, no, I mean Summit, <laughs> and we did this thing called immutable awesomeness, and we, we believe that the combination of supply chain and this kind of uh, ability to move fast in a pattern that I'll describe, ultimately, I believe, is the new guns, germs, and steel. Right, and it also sets the, the, the groundwork for, um, for the difference between haves and have-nots. So if you look at you know, what we called in our presentation immutable awesomeness, it's that same kind of center of gravity, only now data and infrastructure are the center. And what you're looking to build is your information and knowledge nodes such that you create shorter distance, lower latency, and here again, a cybernetic feedback loop or feedback loops that just uh, kind of roll on top of each other. So you get faster and faster. The quicker you do feedback loops, the more feedback you get. But um, you're going to hear later today a um, presentation by Jez Hubble and Nicole on some of the DevOps survey. And two of my favorite metrics in that, um, in that survey is lead time and MTTR. And, and they'll what's spend... What's MTTR? A mean time to repair, resolve. Um, it's about restoration of services. And, um, and so I love lead time, because to me, that's what immutability and immutable delivery is about, shortening lead time, moving faster. Um, it's no surprise that I'm going to talk about Docker within the next five minutes. But, but the, the, the point is, there's a model, there are patterns of delivery now that I believe um, create even faster than known delivery patterns today on what we call lead time. So lead time, you know, depending on your flavor, I like to say it's the ha ha to ka -ching. It's the whiteboard to you're making money. But there's variants of that. There's, there's um, to deploy, a ha to deploy, story to deploy. In general, it's a measurement about how fast that you can deliver services that customers will pay for. In the meantime, to resolve, restore is, is I think, partly where the supply chain adds to the story in that you start getting resilience because you build, and, and Josh will talk more about the supply chain model, but some of the patterns there that create this resilience that otherwise this speed by itself might be dangerous. So here again, or not here again, my, my theory, and not really my theory, it's a lot of people are buying into this right now, is that there's this really interesting convergence right now of containers and microservices. My favorite flavor of container is going to be Docker. Sorry. Um, but, but what we're finding, and I, and I know there's a lot of debate, like microservices are not Docker and Docker is not microservices. And that's absolutely true. But what is absolutely true is the two complement each other incredibly well. You know, like they were perfect, almost perfectly made for each other. This containerized infrastructure, short, sweet, low TTL, instantiates in sub, sub second, 400, 500 millisecond instantiation of compute, uh, burn down time, like, you know, 50 milliseconds, right? So, so you, this idea, and, and then, you know, with microservices, and I'm not going to have enough time to go into the deep microservices discussion, I've got uh, two definitions on an upcoming slide. But the idea of having bounded context infrastructure that marries well with a containerized, lightweight, fast speed and can deliver really quick. And I, I think that that is becoming um, the, the new, that pattern for at least delivery and speed of delivery is um, part of this new guns, germs, and teal. But getting to know uh, Josh and actually reminding me that the Toyota supply chain definition and model is actually pure Deming. And going back to the concept of thinking about you know, how you apply supply chain. Um, you're going to talk about some of this. Yeah, so the supply chain model and how you put that in. It was kind of the answer to my, like I always knew I was doing something dirty. 
I knew that immutable infrastructure by itself was very dangerous. And I'll give you the really short version. A developer can create infrastructure on their laptop, and if they test it, and it, and here's the thing, imagine a microservices world, I got seven or eight other services, I got my own service, I pull down those seven, eight services on my laptop, so now I can emulate full-blown environment, a complete service-oriented architecture, or a microservice architecture, on my laptop. For the most part, I can test almost all my infrastructure, bit for bit, on my laptop. If that goes green, the promise that I get is that bit for bit, and I watched some of the security guys getting ready to punch me in the throat right now, um, <laughs> the, the bit for bit, that will be the same bits that can be in production. And, we, and for, with containerized architecture, we don't care where it lies. Right? So I'm not rebuilding infrastructure. I, I am reducing um, entropy. I'm building an infrastructure that truly is immutable. Now the danger there is obvious. It's a black box. And again, when I started talking about jo to Josh about what if we could inject models or methods that make them both live together well. And so for those of you who um, are not familiar with uh, microservices, you know, I think there's two really good definitions out there. It's like there's a billion definitions, but uh, I, I, I think Sam Newman gets the, the checkbox because he wrote the book. It's the O'Reilly uh, microservices book, small autonomous services that work together. But I, I, my personal favorite is Adrian Krakow, one of the original architects of uh, Netflix, says uh, they're loosely coupled service-oriented architectures with bounded context. I like to add that it's uh, about the size that a two pizza team of developers can, can grok and handle and manage. Yeah, and I think even Sam says at one point, like, I know one when I see one, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's small, it, you know. Um, but so, if that didn't make any sense, maybe this will. There's this famous, um, I, I use it a lot in what I call immutable decomposition, but it's, um, it, it's um, a Joe Bentley, a bunch of computer scientists from way back. Joe Bentley did this challenge to uh, Donald Knuth, the famous Don, Donald Knuth. And the challenge was to write a program, to read a file, determine the most frequently used words, and print out a sorted list of those words with their frequencies. So Donald Knuth being the elegant programmer wrote this really nice, and it was really more a definition and argument of style. It wasn't like who could do the best and the fastest. And this uh, Doug McLeroy commented on it and said, I can do this with these, uh, these um, Unix commands. And so, so it blew everybody's mind, right? And, and, and Douglas McLeroy is actually considered the father of the Unix, the Linux, uh, the Unix command line or pipe. And, um, but the thing was, this to me defines, I love this from an immutable decomposition, and I love it because it, it, when you think about each one of these commands, you know, trace, the sort, the unique, like none of those were defined to solve this problem. In the, br the brilliance of our forefathers of, um, of Unix, they put together this subset of tools almost, you know, pre-assuming a microservices architecture. And here's the beauty, right? All those could be pulled as ephemeral pieces and components put together for this composition, solve that problem and all go away. And that's, I think that, you know, I mean, I think, I, I'm not a software architect, but I think a software architecture strives to get to a place where they can build that uh, level of composition between the components that are available. And then um, I'm gonna finish off with just two stories, one is, this is actually a Docker customer, a um, company called Gilt. They got acquired, but in, in our 2014, um, this Mike Bresnick gives this presentation, and I'm such a junkie, like, I can tell you, even if I wouldn't look at the slide, at 2804 in this presentation, he blows my mind. And, and the thing is, Gilt is kind of famous for uh, a poster child for going to microservices. Um, they, like, there's been a lot of stories written about, and they present a lot about how how they've written microservices. But the thing that they talked about, he talked about here is, this just goes back to the immutable delivery model I described. He said that, he says, you know, now all our developers have to supply is this one metafile definition. And everything gets, gets processed through automation. And it happens, again, theoretically at the laptop all the way through the pipeline to, to production delivery. And what he says is, Prior to this model, 
there were thousands of scripts and release engineering through and all sorts of pieces and componentry that they had been managed by all different teams and now it's all owned by the developers. And everything else is kind of infrastructure provided. It, it, it's, it, it really is something. And, and if we look at what, um, you know, we look at um, Google, Amazon, Netflix is famous for immutable infrastructure. Like our, our web titans have been there for a while in all variants of this immutable infrastructure. I mean, read the Borg paper, right? You, you, I mean, they were doing immutable function lambdas 10 years ago. Um, but it's not just for the web titans, Capital One, actually um, has talked about actually at the DevOps Enterprise Summit how they're implementing immutable delivery models. And this is a large bank, right? So um, anyway, um, that's all time I really have, except for I want to close with, you know, that I think that in conclusion of my part is, you know, this data and infrastructure is a new center of gravity. Like we're working on data, we got IoT coming, those type of things, data is just exploding. I, Docker, I believe, is the killer app for microservices, and I think supply chain is the killer app for a, for a model that Docker can deliver, which is immutable delivery infrastructure. Great. All right, can we switch to the other laptop, please? So, parts of DevOps terrify me. Parts of microservices terrify me. Parts of Docker terrify me. If anybody is new in security as long as I have, we used to use Norton Ghost to do our clean room for the virus handling. And you know it was awesome because I didn't have to rebuild a fresh OS every time. But then we got sprawl because we had so many images and image management became an issue, right? And the same thing happened with VM sprawl. And the same thing happened with Solaris containers. And now the same thing's happening again with Docker and Docker Hub. So done wrong, it's an amplification or force multiplier of bad hygiene. Done well, it's the same force multiplier and amplification of good hygiene. So we don't have a choice. We can't hope and, and wait for them to maybe accidentally get it right. We have to help them get it right. And part of that is not telling them to care about security, but to show the benefits that if we can do some supply chain intelligence, supply chain hygiene, and apply Deming principles, they already love Deming. And most of the, if you look at the history of, of, secure, of uh, software development, uh, Lean came from uh, Deming, Agile came from Deming, DevOps comes from Deming. The fuller embrace of Deming is to take the last piece they haven't taken yet, which is the supply chain principles he bought, brought to Toyota post-World War II. And I'm gonna say these three times, I believe, but number one, these three principles changed manufacturing and can change software factories. Number one, use fewer and better suppliers. Number two, use the highest quality parts from those high quality suppliers. And number three, you have the traceability and visibility to track which parts went where throughout manufacturing so that when something goes wrong, you can do a prompt and agile re uh, recall or, or fix. So what I want to do is show you what we're showing DevOps people about how much development waste we can cut out. And this is just developer waste. There's also a calculator for operational waste. There's also one for security damage if you want to see this. But uh, hats off to Bob Rudis, Harbor Master on Twitter, who uses mad data biz skills to help put this together. Um, I'm going to show you a little story using not slides, but, uh, but pictures. So we said earlier, software's eating the world. Here's a big green piece of software. The problem is we don't write software anymore. Most of you have figured out after Heartbleed that 80 to 90% of a modern application is assembled from third-party parts like OpenSSL, Apache Struts 2, Apache Commons collections, right? We're not really writing, we're composing, right? Anybody quickly guess how many uh, components are in an average application? How many third-party libraries? Anybody quick? All right, I'm gonna say 50, right? So there's 50 unique parts, and you can play with this on your own later, right? There's 50 unique parts that maybe you chose to make this application happen. Clearly a mobile app will be smaller, a massive thing like healthcare.gov will be like 10,000 different parts, including 11 competing logging frameworks in the same site. Um, now, while you choose 50, um, what we find is that whether you wanted these or not, you got about 106 on average. So we did the first ever state of the software supply chain report where we looked at thousands and thousands of applications, and this was our finding. The average is about 106 unique parts. You picked 50, they picked things that they depended upon. And whoever coined this first at Microsoft, I first heard it from Brian Fox, um, software ages like milk, not like wine, so these are not all healthy. And again, this is not a security argument, but if you look at known vulnerabilities in the NIST database, as a ratio of those 106 parts, there's 23% have a, uh, some sort of known vulnerability. And into a developer, in the context of developer waste, any one of those is the potential for 
the, the words they hate, unplanned, unscheduled work with painful context switching that makes them not on time, not on budget, and they hurt their sprint or their scrum team and their commitments to the business. They're not on time to market. They lose customers. They lose bonus. So these are just essentially another form of waste. And if Lean's about reducing the eight types of waste, this is essentially a type of waste that's unmeasured and therefore unmanaged and therefore an opportunity. So they're not all going to manifest, but they don't just worry about hackers. They also worry about lawyers. So what we also find is about 8% have a restrictive license. That's the purple ring there. Something like uh, copy left or AGPL that can get you in trouble. Um, rumor is Cisco paid $300, $400 million to the Free Software Foundation after a license violation. So any one of these can be a trigger for unplanned, unscheduled work. Now, while we've been drawing this little Petri dish, at the bottom, what you might not see is, let's say 10% of these in a given year manifest and burn you. I can name a few from the last 18 months, right? Uh, OpenSSL, Apache Commons Collections, Bash, right? There's, there's dozens of these, but let's say 10% of the manifest at 100 bucks an hour, 10 hours of work, which is really conservative, right? Stop what you're doing, check, am I using that vulnerable version of the library? Download the new one, check the API compatibility, do a continuous integration build, do a sanity check, push to production. And even though DevOps can do this very quickly, it's at least a, a 10 hour delay. Now you might be saying, who cares? So out of these numbers, um, you can't read this, but I'll read it to you. Three components out of 22 uh, requiring 30 hours to fix at th is about $3,000 of wasted development time. Not a big deal, right? But now that we have a data model behind it, thanks to Bob Brutus, you're not writing an app, you're touching 10, maybe more. Your team is probably touching 100. And even at the small scale of 100, when Fortune 100 companies are in the thousands, if you have even 100 applications, you're talking about a quarter of a million dollars of developer waste doing completely elective, avoidable, unplanned, unscheduled work. The day you went to grab Bouncy Castle Crypto API, you grabbed the version from 2007 that has a level 10 vulnerability in it, when right next to it was one that didn't, that was completely avoidable. So the failure to look at the hygiene or the expiration date on the open source software we consume caused unplanned, unscheduled work that was entirely avoidable. And then when there is something that goes wrong, it took Phyllis Schneck six and a half weeks to scan the .gov websites to figure out where Heartbleed was. Six and a half weeks for mean time to identify, let alone repair. Whereas if you had a manifest, a manifest or a bill of materials of which parts went where, when Honda had the Takata airbag issue, they didn't recall every Honda. They knew exactly which vehicle identification numbers had exactly which bad batch, and they could do something very quickly at a lower cost. So the idea again, here's the second time, use fewer and better suppliers, higher quality parts from those suppliers, and track which parts go where, the benefits to development are gonna be less unplanned on scheduled work. The benefits to operations are gonna be fewer service interruptions and break fixes. And the benefits uh, when something bad happens is faster mean time to identify and repair. And these are the key metrics that you're gonna hear from uh, people like Jez and Nicole shortly. Now, if these are the meals that we're serving, we're getting these ingredients from our refrigerator, right? Or our kitchen cabinet. So on the other side here, how many projects are people storing in their re local repositories? So developers will have about 7,600, but I can't really draw that. So here's 300 projects. We see for popular projects, about 27 versions of each of those. So you can see about 27 dots within each of those circles. The purple, again, is a tainted li a license. And then most of those are either old, buggy, less functional, different API, maybe some software vulnerabilities. Let's say 70% being gen generous here are undesirable. And what you've essentially got is mostly red and purple stuff. So if you have rotten food in your refrigerator, you're going to have rotten ingredients making it into your dishes that you serve your customers. So the idea here is if you click on any one of these, this one project with 106 projects is sourced from some subset of the projects that we keep in our cabinet or fridge and how many versions of them. We had one Fortune 50 company who's using, well, I think it's 83 versions of Spring concurrently in production, 83 different versions. So think of the operational chaos and entropy from supporting simultaneously all the different APIs and all the different bugs and all the different glitches. So the belief here is if we could drop down the total number of logging frameworks that your developers use, if we could make sure they're using the, the freshest or least vulnerable versions of those, and if we could track which ones go where, notice I didn't really make security and risk reduction arguments, but guess how much elective attack surface, elective complexity, mean time to identify and repair you can gain. So I don't hate DevOps anymore. 
I found ways that we can use our wit to get a massive security gain in a way that is Trojan horsed in tremendous dev and operational efficiencies that they care about. Can we switch to the, this one and then wrap up, please? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. All right, so the two little words we want you to think about for the first chunk of today is the known vulnerabilities. And to punctuate this, the last Verizon database report showed of the successful compromises last year, 97% of them were not zero days, were not exotic espionage attacks. They were known vulnerabilities in the NIST database. Eight of those 10 had a patch available for more than 10 years. So if we could, instead of trying to find ways to do like, you know, really hard stuff and make the way we did it in Waterfall and Agile try to force fit its way into a, an hourly deployment cycle, if we could focus on something like software supply chain hygiene, then what we do is in the combination with Docker, this is the payoff slide. The most, I can't name him, he wouldn't let me. The most impressive application security executive I've ever met has been on BSIM since day one. So he's a big, devout fan of BSIM. And because of his BSIM leadership stance, he's probably got the best metric I've ever seen for KLOC, right? So he's critical and high defect rate per 10,000 lines of code. Critical and high security defects per 10,000 lines of code. His personal best was six, which is amazing. When he came to this new organization, they were already at 10, which is probably one of the best in the world. So 10 critical and high defects per 10,000 lines of code. After working with us for the last three years on some of these supply chain principles without a whole lot of you know, help, uh, he got down to four and broke his personal record. When he added that first of the three supply chain principles from Deming of using fewer suppliers, all he did was go to the senior vice president's engineering and said, we use an awful lot of open source projects. Could we please use the top three logging frameworks instead of every logging framework on Earth? So he hasn't even done principle two and three yet. He got it down to one critical and high defect per 10,000 lines of code. Now bring in DevOps, even though his peers think it's reckless and irresponsible doing microservices in Docker, when he applied the idea that Docker will make things much, much better or much, much worse, when he applied software hygiene in a Docker context to reduce the operational variance of who's using which deviant versions of, of which stack of software, he got it down to point one critical and high defect. You could never do that with Docker alone. You might actually make it worse. And you can never do that with security alone, because it just doesn't scale. So in about two years, he went from 10 critical and high to point one critical and high with a combination of guns, germs, and steel, which is software supply chains, Docker, and microservices. So I hope you see this opportunity. And later today, you're going to hear amazing things uh, from amazing people on various parts of the SDL. But there is a real opportunity here for us to be leaders and be bullish and be optimistic about ways we can actually improve our security versus lament the things we might have lost. Thank you, and we'll transition to the next.